Well, good morning. Good morning. It sure is good to see everyone here this morning. Um, I appreciate your presence. I'm glad you're here. I know uh, you didn't get up this morning, expected to uh, hear a sermon from me, but as we said, Jason is, Jason is sick, so I'm, I'm filling in. Um, you're our honored guest today. You're, we're glad that you're here. We're, we're glad we're all here together. What a great day it's been to gather here. We've been able to sing songs of praise to the Lord. We've been able to gather around the Lord's table. We've been able to pray to the Lord. We've been able to study from his word. What a, what a, great, what a great day. It's, whenever I get a chance to speak before people, I know it's an awesome responsibility because I'm speaking the word of the Lord. I'm trying to teach something that's from the word of the Lord. So I'm praying today that I can say something that, that it will be profitable, that you'll find what I say is profitable, and that I teach from the word of the Lord. And if it turns out that I am teaching from the word of the Lord, I would ask that you would respond to it. But likewise, if I'm teaching anything that's an error, I would consider you my friend if you would correct me and let me know about it. In just a few minutes, we're going to have the song that's been suggested. Everything's been prepared. And if you need to make your, right, your life right with the Lord, then today's the day. Today is the time of the Lord. So when Jason called me the other night, and I told my family that I was preaching this morning, um, Without exception, in unison, they all said to me, just remember, you're not Jason. So <laughs> about 20 to 25 minutes is going to be enough, okay? And I said, all right, I got, I got, the, I got the message. I got, I got the message, all right? Uh, but, but then they asked me, what are you going to be preaching about? And I said, I'm going to be preaching about things that are in hell that we as a church need. And I got, wait a second, wait a second, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is us being able to see things that are unseen. That is us seeing the unseen. Of course, your first reaction is, wait a second, if we can't see it, then, you know, if it's unseen, we can't see it. What are you talking about? Well, the Bible talks about this, right? The Bible talks about us seeing things that are unseen. You may look at, look at, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, it says, we walk by faith and not by sight, okay? We, we don't live our lives by the things we can see. We live our lives by the things we can't see, by heaven, by the throne of God, by God, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Those aren't things we can see. Those are unseen things. That's how we live our lives. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, it says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. So if we're Christians this morning, our faith is based on things that we can't see. We haven't seen God. In this life, we're not going to see God. We didn't see Jesus Christ. We weren't at the cross, but we've seen the evidence. We have faith of the things not seen. And so that's really what I'm, what I'm talking about today, is making sure that we can see the unseen you know if we're if we're christians we may have a problem with that in that we we obviously live in a in a physical world it, it would be it would be rather you know inappropriate for me to say that well we're not we're not physical beings we are physical but we have a spiritual side as well we're not merely physical that's one part of us but we're also spiritual and it's the spiritual part that's been made in the image of god not our physical bodies, not how we look and, and this world and all this matter and energy and space and time and all that kind of stuff, those are all created by God. Our souls have been created by God, but in the image of God. And so we are as much spiritual beings as we are physical beings. And that's really what I want to talk about today, that we're different because we see the unseen, because we live our lives seeing heaven and seeing God, seeing the throne of God. So what I want us to do today is I want us to read about a man that Jesus tells us about in the New Testament. And this is a man who lived his life and then he went to hell. And we see him in hell and we see him in torment in hell. We don't know this guy's name, all right? But you can tell that he's a very successful man. 
that he is wealthy, he's got a good job, he's got a big house, he's got lots of land, he's got lots of property, lots of money, but still, nevertheless, or because of all that, he ends up in torment in hell. So look in Luke chapter 16, and let's read this, let's read this together. And I always encourage everyone to get your Bibles out and, and read the passages along with us. Because I think it's just important for everyone to read the passages and see with their own eyes the things that we're talking about. So in Luke 16, starting in verse 19, here's where we read about this rich man. Luke 16, starting in verse 19. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from, from here to you will not be able, and none may cross over from there to us. And he said, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. The things I want to talk about today are some things that we see with this rich man in hell that I think the church needs, okay? We're going to take this example of this rich man. He died unprepared, and he ended up in hell. And there were things that he learned in hell, but he learned too late. It was too late for him, and everything we're talking about today, it's too late. It was too late for him. He learned those things too late, but they're not too late for us, and I think they're things that we need. The first thing that we see in hell is that this man is praying, and he is praying fervently, okay? He, in his life, he had all his riches, he had his house, his clothes, and all this fancy stuff, and I'm thinking he did not have time for God. He didn't have time for God, he didn't pray, he didn't worry about anything because he had everything he needed. But now that he's in hell, he is praying, and he is praying fervently, okay? He is praying fervently. And look at what he's praying for, okay? First of all, he's praying for his own comfort. He's praying for mercy. It's too late for that mercy, but he's praying for mercy. He wants mercy from God. He's begging God for mercy. He's asking that, that they send Lazarus just to dip the fing his finger in, in water just to cool his tongue. Just that little bit of mercy. And he's praying fervently for that. But look at what else he's praying for. He's praying for his family. He says, I've got, I got five brothers in my father's house. We've got to do something. Okay? He is praying fervently for them. He says, I beg you therefore, Father, that you send to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify them lest they come to this place of torment. As a church, we need to pray fervently, just like this man. He learned too late, but we can learn from him and learn that we need to pray fervently. Why? Because we're praying to a God who will answer us. We are praying to a great and powerful God that wants to give us these good things. He is going to answer you in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, it says, This is the confidence in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, 
we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. God says if we will pray to him in faith with, with clean hands, lifting up holy hands to him, he will answer our prayers. He wants to give us those good things. And when we get serious about praying as a congregation, one of the things that we're going to pray for is we're going to pray for the lost. We're going to pray that God will open doors that we can talk to people about God, that we can teach them the word of God, that we're going to pray for, for open doors. Now, that can be difficult because we have so many things going on in our lives. We all have to work. We have families. There are things we have to do. And we have to be careful because God can answer our prayer, open a door, and we can miss it. And it can be somebody that we're praying for, that we've been praying for for a long time because we want to teach them the word of God. And then God opens that door and we miss it. But we need to pray that way. We need to pray for open doors and pray for opportunities to teach pe people the word of God. And we need to pray that as a congregation here, that when that door is open, that someone can go through that door and can teach the gospel. And I got to tell you, that's something that I struggle with because I can confess to you, there's been times where I've prayed for an open door to teach someone the gospel and then when that door was opened, I missed it and it was only sometime later that I looked back and said, oh, that door was open and I completely, I completely missed it. But as a congregation, as people, we need to be praying fervently, just like that rich man in hell who was praying fervently. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. This is actually one of my favorite verses about prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Paul the apostle is saying, As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face. Now, this is what praying is all about. Look at what he says. He doesn't say we're praying every day. He says, no, we are praying night and day. Night and day we are praying. But he doesn't just say, well, night and day we're praying or we are praying or night and day. We, he says we keep praying. Look at that. Night and day we keep praying ongoing every day night and day we are keeping on praying and then how is he praying he doesn't say we're praying just earnestly praying he says most earnestly night and day keep praying most earnestly that's an example of how we need to pray right there you know that wasn't once a once a week you find some time to pray it wasn't um you know i'm going to pray over meals or or i found out someone is sick so i'm going to say a little prayer for them or or something like that or or sometimes we'll tell people well you know i'll be thinking about you or i'll be praying about you he was night and day keep praying most earnestly was the way he was praying let's look at another verse colossians chapter 4 and verse 2 in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, here is Paul again talking about prayer, telling us that we need to devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. I want to look at two words in this passage. The first word is devote or devoted. That's the same word that's used in talking about relationships between husbands and wives. Devoted to one another. It's also the same word that's used to talk about a congregation, that we are devoted to one another, to the well-being of one another. And we know what that word devoted means. You know, if someone came to you and they said, well, hey, I, I'm devoted to golf. You know, I like golf. I'm devoted to it. And you said, well, when, when was the last time you played? And you said, well, I played, you know, a few months ago. Well, what kind of clubs do you have? Oh, yeah, I can't remember what kind of clubs I've got. Well, well, what kind of golf balls do you like to use? Well, I just, whatever the cheap ones I can get from 
wait a minute, you're not devoted to golf. We know what devoted means. And he's saying, be devoted to prayer. It's got to be something you're doing every day. You're devoted to it. It's not something that's going to happen by accident. Devoted to it. But now look at this other word that's in here. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. Look at that word alert. Alert is actually a military term, okay? And if you want to know what the word alert means, if you've been our, in our study in Nehemiah, think about those people that were building the wall. What were they doing? They had a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other hand, okay? And they were praying to God every day. Now, that's being alert, alert in prayer. They know they're working. They also know they're in a fight, okay? They know they're armed. They got to be vigilant. They know that Satan is coming after them. So they are in that fight. They're alert, and they're prepared. They are ready at a moment's notice. They're not like, wait a second, give me a few minutes, let me go find all my gear, and I'll come... It's like, no, they are right there ready, knowing that they are working on one hand and they're in a fight on the other hand. We talk about the armor of God. We teach all of our kids about the armor of God, right? And we have everything about the armor of God memorized. In Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 11, it says, put on the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, the heavenly forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. I mean, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, we put, we gird our loins with truth, we put on the breastplate of righteousness, shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel, take up the shield of faith, Put on the helmet of salvation. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But now, look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on alert with all perseverance, perseverance and petition for all saints. The way the armor of God works is through prayer. Prayer is what gives the armor of God its power. That's where the power comes from. Prayer isn't listed as one of the pieces of armor of God because it's part of every single one of them. It's required to make every single one of those work. If, I mean, think about it. If I'm, if I'm doing something with the word of God or the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, how effective am I going to be without prayer? If you're not praying in conjunction with, with those things, with using the armor of God, they're not going to work. It's prayer that gives them the power. So you think about this rich man. He learned too late, but he is in hell and he is praying fervently. He is pleading to God, praying fervently that God would answer his prayer. It's too late for him. God's not going to answer those prayers. But it's not too late, and we, it's not too late for us, and we need to pray fervently like that rich man in hell learned too late. To try to keep it to the 20 or 25 minutes, I'm not Jason, um, I've got one more major point, and then the lesson will be yours. The other thing that we see from this rich man in hell is he is deeply, deeply concerned and compassionate for the lost. He prays to God that somehow, some way, that somebody can go teach his brothers the word of God. He says, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify them, lest they also come to this place of torment. In hell, this rich man is really deeply, compassionately concerned about his family who are lost. That's something that we all need to be concerned with. We need to have compassion for lost souls. 
God has given us a work, and our work is to teach the gospel. God has done his part. He sent Jesus Christ. Christ bore our sins on the cross, but now it's up to us to take the gospel and to preach the gospel. If you look at this rich man, if he could do it over again, he would be the teacher. He would be there teaching. Now, he may not have literally been the teacher because he may have had other skills and, and, and those kind of things, but he was deeply concerned about the lost. And if he could have gone back to his brothers, he would have taught them about God. He would have talked to them about God. He would have, he would have done whatever he could have to get them to hear the word of God, to understand about God, to understand the things of God, to see the unseen. He would have done this. That's the kind of people that we need to be. He would have, he would have said, look, all of this stuff that we have here, it, you know, things, this house, all this land, this property, all this other stuff is just, it's just not important. It's just not important. The things that matter are the things about God. He would have gone back and he would have somehow taught them that. In hell, he's got compassion for, his, for lost souls. He didn't seem to have that kind of compassion when he was living. When he was living, it was all his nice stuff and his wonderful this and his house and all this other kind of stuff. But in hell, he doesn't care anything about that. In hell, he cares about his lost souls in Acts chapter 5 verse 42 describing the early church it says daily in the temple in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ if we can simply start each day and each day spend some time seeing the unseen having compassion for lost souls then we can be like this people described here in acts and we can not cease teaching and preaching jesus as the christ in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 we can look at this you know heaven is a certainty we can't see it but we know it's a certainty. Likewise, hell we can't see, but it's a certainty. How can we look at people in this world that are lost and then not have compassion for them? The Bible says we must all appear before the judgment sheet of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. I mean, that's our job. That's, our, that's what we know, and that's what we need to do right there. I want to shift focus just for a little bit as we wrap this up this morning. Um, talk a little bit about our own families. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, You fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. You know, our children are going to see what kind of faith that we have, okay? They're going to see whether or not we take the eternal things as reality, whether or not we can see the, the unseen. You know, I almost wish there was like a divine hypodermic needle, all right? Because you just kind of get them, inject some faith into them, and they're good to go, right? And then if, if they start to get wavering a little bit, get, get them with a little booster shot, you know? But it, it, it's not going to work that way, right? It's not going to work that way, all right? Look, in, in James chapter 2, verse, verse 18, it says that some of you will say, I have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works, Okay? Our children are going to see our faith by what we do, 
okay we can talk and talk and talk and we can try to teach and say this and say that and say the other thing but it's going to be our actions it's going to be what we do that has an effect on them okay they're going to see our faith by what we do not by what we say and what we want our children to have is a faith of their own we want them to have a genuine faith that is their own because what's going to happen is at some point they're going to grow up they're going to leave leave the house they're going to leave the home they're going to go out into the world they have to have a faith of their own and and even all the little kids that we have here and i'm so grateful for all of these these little children but i've got a prediction for you okay you looked around at all these little kids sometime in the next roughly 18 to 20 years they're going to grow up they're going to graduate from high school they're going to graduate from college they're probably going to get married and they're probably going to have children and i know that's a pretty bold prediction on my part that 20 years from now that's going to happen but i'm thinking it's going to happen so what does that mean they've got to have a faith of their own they can't have our faith they've got to have their own faith it's got to be a genuine faith that's their faith look at what happened in judges chapter 2 okay familiar passage and, and i read this as i was preparing for this lesson and, and i just almost started crying at this situation it says all that generation also were gathered to the fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the lord nor yet the work which he had done for israel there arose another generation after them who did not know the lord an entire generation of children grew up that didn't know the lord why didn't they know the lord because their parents didn't teach them the parents didn't teach them about the lord or the parents tried to teach them and they didn't instill into them a genuine faith of their own you know what does that mean we got to teach them to think for themselves okay we're going to teach them the gospel but they're going to have to learn the gospel they're going to have to understand it we aren't going to be able to force them to do anything they're going to have to do it on their own they're going to question us okay at some point they're going to get old enough and they're going to start questioning us they're going to ask questions why are we doing this why are we doing that why why do we believe this and let me tell you that's a good thing because that means they're thinking they're using their brain okay and all i can say is the answer can't be well that's just what we believe okay that can never be the answer it's got to be well let's talk about it let's study this okay one of the the definitions of truth that i try to use is truth is that which stands up best under argument now i'm not talking about argument as in let's fight but let's put let's study this and let's come up with point one point two point three point four of what the bible says about this topic and let's put forth let's discuss this let's debate it let's make sure we've got this right let's make sure that our children understand it not that they can just repeat it or that's just what it says or well that's just what this it, it's no they understand it and they can talk about it and they have it in their heads and they have it in their hearts that's the kind of faith and the kind of argument that the kind of faith and the kind of ability to, to discuss and debate that we want our children to be able to have a genuine faith of their own so you know at some point they're going to grow up they're going to leave home they have to have a faith of their own they're not going to get into heaven on our coattails they've got to have their own faith so to wrap this up now we've talked a little bit about the, the rich man and i actually think there's a lot more things that we could talk about this about this rich man that's in hell because there's a lot more things that he learned in hell that were too late but we've talked about two things because in hell we now see this rich man who is praying fervently he is praying fervently and the other thing in hell we see this rich man and he has a deep concern for the lost he has deep compassion for the lost he has a deep concern for his family and he wants to teach them about god 
So, what kind of conclusions can we draw from this? If someone could spend five minutes in hell, do you think that would change their point of view? I'm thinking it would. I'm thinking five minutes in hell would completely change your point of view. The only thing is, God's not going to let that happen. That's not going to happen. Not one of us, not anybody we know, is going to get five minutes in hell. Okay? God has given us the scripture that gives us the picture of what hell is. We have to see the unseen. We have to be able to teach people about hell. If that rich man had had that opportunity to go back and live his life over again, I guarantee you it would have been a lot different. But God has given us the scripture. God has given us this picture of hell. We need to learn from it. We need to teach others. So, just a couple, couple more points. One passage we know well, it's appointed, it's appointed for men once to die and after this, the judgment. God has done his part. God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he took the entire sins of the world in his body on the cross. So he paid the penalty for everyone in the world, for every sin that had been committed that will be committed. He paid the price for that. We we have to confess our sins, repent of our sins, and be baptized with Christ into that death. If we do that, we'll be forgiven of our sins, and we'll be reconciled with God and be a child of God, a joint heir with Christ. If there's anyone today that needs to respond to the word, to be baptized, to wash your sins away, now's the opportunity as we stand and sing.